Great. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, so the next talk is from Stein and Anna Dottir and Magnix uh, Felix Triggerson, um, which I'm, I'm very interested in, partly because it's it's what to me feels like an area that's the other side of the tracks, which is the real world of, of you know, um, companies in the wild making things, having a big user base and having to, to, to work with these things in a very different place from academia. And I mean, obviously, as I said earlier, part of the network is for that to stop feeling like it is across the tracks and, and, and see what there is in common and how we can engage with that more meaningfully. Um, so Steinen and Magnus are both here um, to present their current work with uh, Lottie, which is an organization looking at um, helping very young people engage with the digital world. Um, but both have very relevant histories um, in um, organizations prior to that, uh, Stein and particularly as um, senior research engineer at Native Instruments and Magnum as, uh, Magnus as the interaction engineer at Kiska, uh, an Austrian product design agency. So um, yeah, we're very happy to have you both here and um, yeah, I'll, I'll shut up and let you take over. Thank you. I'll uh, see if I can manage to share my screen here. Um, so yeah, so can everyone see this as a full screen presentation yep. now? Looks Perfect. Good. Perfect. Yes. So thank you, Tom, for the nice intro and, and thank you, Tom and Simon, for the invitation and, and also to Wendy for a really inspiring talk. Um, I'm Steinun. I uh, am here also yeah, with my colleague Magnus from Lotti, and we wanted to give a bit of an insight uh, to our journey and, and motivation behind, um, let's say, mini music activities that we are developing at Lotti. Uh, but for the maybe for the bigger picture, we are actually at Lotti, yeah, as, as Tom described, developing a larger product that should help kids, uh, uh, very young children, two to seven, um, develop a healthy and sustainable relationship with digital media and screen time. So uh, a part of that is, is are these, these music and, and music and audio activities and, and how and the thought of how could we bring kids on board early, early to these um, these activities and, and as I said, like, we'll talk about it a bit more on the broader level, the motivation and how we got there and then more precisely show uh, a bit of insights into the, our current work. Um, so first, should we do quick introductions? Do you want to start, Magnus? Give a bit of insights to your background. Uh, yeah, sure. So hi everyone, I'm Magnus, uh, and currently I'm a developer at Lottie, software developer. Um, I have a classical education in computer science, but in the last years I've been very interested in uh, interactions and uh, working with designers on uh, figuring out how products feel and how it feels to use them. At Lottie, I am uh, focusing on uh, building mainly prototyping experiences that we think will work for kids. Uh, and being a musician myself, I am especially interested in every, anything that has to is related to music. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and and as Magnus said, like he's yeah, it was also on purpose that we we surrounded ourselves actually with quite a lot of music people. So we have Magnus, who's a producer, and has also done some research in the past on in the music domain. We have. Also, quite a few people from uh, the music space, uh, from uh, SoundCloud here in Berlin, as well as well as a classical music platform called Idazio. So, so there's a lot of we have a lot of hidden agenda, let's say, uh, here at the music bunch at the company. But yeah, to me, I'm I'm as Tom said, uh, Steinen and I. I was previously before Lottie at Native Instruments, where I've spent most of my career. Uh, it was quite a growth journey joining Native, about 100 people and, and, and growing it to 600 people uh, over these 12 years, which also allowed for, for a lot of different um, areas there. Uh, I'm a DSP uh, engineer by training uh, and worked in, in Native's research team for quite some years. 
where I worked on audio effects for all of native products. Uh, and then uh, later headed up our academic um, our academic relations and dialogues with startups and also a bit like, you know, how can we, what does the future, you know, emerging technology have to do with us? And, and, and we had a lot of collaboration projects with actually a lot of familiar faces I'm seeing here. So hello everyone. Um, yeah, we also worked on, uh, like what, what my passion has been throughout my career is, is also, yeah, this democratization of, of music making, how can we flatten the, the learning curve? How can we invite more people to music making? And, and one of them is, is, for example, that we were working with uh, visually impaired producers and musicians at Native and, and, and seeing how we could, how we could yeah, involve them more in our design, um, as well as, yeah, kind of, yeah, doing more of like hack days where we involve more of the company and, and, and treat more users in, in what we do. Uh, I'm I'm also very passionate in in music education and and also just kind of looking at my own journey of of learning you know learning the piano and and actually I would have loved to be more more involved in in, in you know more formally training in in some more tech uh, tech world and that's also been kind of a driver driver for my personally and 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 a lot of people around me and and. And how can we how can we make yeah music more more and music making more present in in our kids and 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 with, with yeah more people because there's a lot of us interested in, in, in making music so that's uh, I think yeah already diving a bit into into the motivation here so I, I don't think I need to talk for a long time in this crowd about how uh, music production has gotten a lot simpler in the in the last year. So since the mid '90s, how the bigger studios have moved into the into computers and 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 it's been in terms of availability, there's been a huge transformation and, and democratization. And what what is beautiful about the ecosystem, you know, is is of course the availability, but also for me as a music tool maker my product works with your product. So my success is your success. And I think this really defines you know, the really the nice vibe that we have in this field and the friendliness between both companies and, and, and in the industry and also researchers. And then also the freedom for musicians. Uh, they have the freedom to choose whatever tools they want and, 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 um, and they all work together. And that's really the beauty of it. And that's you know, based on some frameworks and standards that really make everything work together. Um, however, I think I don't need to speak many words about it as well, is that, yeah, I mean, these DAWs and, and, and the whole ecosystem, I mean, these are very uh, powerful tools when you know how to use them. And uh, when you've kind of mastered them, you can, you can really do a lot in them, but it's also takes quite a bit of time to get into it and you you yeah you need to spend quite a few evenings on tutorials and 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 so on so so i think yeah that that's that's i think that the second step that you need to think about is how can we make the process a bit more accessible so i say like it, this world works in a sense but 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 i think you know for beginners and intermediates like how could we onboard onboard people to our world and uh, and then also to the standards, you know, kind of in more general, standards are made to make these fixed points where where you know objects can talk together, and and, and the music ecosystem, of course, yeah, it's like this these plugin formats and 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 frameworks, um, but it's also in their inherent nature that they create inertia towards change and 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 uh, trans transforming of the workflow and 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 and, and innovation and and. In the yeah, so in the in the music domain, for example, that you know we've seen a lot of really interesting uh, new interfaces coming out for for example for synthesizers and effects and 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 even some yeah some DAWs that are doing things differently, but there are always these points that create the inertia, and when you have that many dependencies of different elements, that that creates the you know it, it gets pretty slow to to yeah to make changes and, and and in a way that's good but but also that can hinder a bit to you know that that we bring 
some transformation or or or, or improvements to the workflow. And and as a that's 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 you know more more in general terms. And this also got us thinking that you know mobile devices they they really gotten more powerful and widespread in the last years and um, could this be better leveraged and um, especially when we talk about younger generations uh, who are children now or even generation set to us defined by I think from 90 for people born from 95 96 to 2010 a lot of these people are mobile first essentially so that's that's a workflow and these are the devices that that people work with and it's not only young people but also a lot of people just in the world in general so so in china in in africa like there there is a lot of people who really go mobile first and and for my children who are two and eight now like it's it's questionable whether they will ever own a laptop uh, uh, i don't know but 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 that's 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 you know that i think people who come into technology that way they have different expectations and then then you have you know, speaking of like how this world today, but like that social media and and uh, and and a lot of the the content out there like really ask for instant gratification and 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 also to be clear, like I don't think you know making creating music and making music it is you know that there are some complex concepts and and I don't think that can be instant instantly made, but but I think there we think there might be might be some uh, way to to think about things to onboard uh, onboard people to 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 music making and uh, and also to be clear i think there's a lot of apps and um, and companies doing also interesting things so it's not about stating that you know it isn't being done at all but but you know there already is but like the question is could it be leveraged further and um to be clear this is an april fall uh, but we found it pretty funny because it's an exaggerated uh, it's an exaggerated statement of what we think how we should not be thinking about uh, mobile devices and developing for mobile devices and music interfaces like let's you know let's not map the current process from laptops and DOS like one by one but let's use it as an opportunity to how can we how you know, can we think things differently? Can we do things more modularly? Can we, yeah, can we innovate on on these processes and 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 have a world that you know at least happen you know lives in parallel and then you know in, in interaction with with what we currently have. So, so again, you know, it's it's the idea is to how can we use also the limitations of of mobile devices compared to some powerful laptop, laptops is. Uh, or, or computers to to think about things in a different way, and of course, the benefit of mobile devices. I mean, they are everywhere. They are with us wherever we go, and and that's also so for what, what a lot of people describe as the benefit is that that whenever I have an idea, I can capture it if I you know where, if on on my mobile device, um, and. Also, speaking to researchers here, like, and I know also the research of, of many people here, and 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 in general, we're you know what I would you know the statement here is not everyone should go and just make all music interfaces on mobile devices. Like, please don't, please don't. Uh, you know, we still have we still need you know expressive inter um, instruments and 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 you know please let's let's continue with that. But that. To say that there, there are these benefits of the widespread and and the how and and how people you know just have them you know how they are I, I saw in some article also with this like how it's actually considered just an extension of, of you know of the body of even you know of of, of a certain generation but um so so yeah so I think there's a lot of benefits um that could be leveraged um, and then there's always been this question, well, but you know, you can't really do anything professional with them. And, and this was also pretty, especially with the first generations, for example, of the iPhone, you know, that that you know, this is a toy, especially was was a lot of the discussion in in the music tech and the music production industry, and and you know, and even like you know, it was part of some conversations in the past. Where like, yeah, well, that would be an insult to our users if we would 
you know, present a product that we you know or, or, or a tool on on these devices uh, and because they're professional and and and, and you know they 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 need more than this. Uh, I'm getting a tea delivery here. Sorry, my my throat is a bit sore. Um, yeah. So 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 I think that that question has also been been around. Uh, for me personally, like I had a pretty was a awakening moment. I don't know if you've seen this. I'm not going to play this video, but this went pretty viral a few years ago. This is a producer and musician called Steve Lacey. Uh, and he was, as I think it is, it was in, in yeah, a few years ago, like three, four, five years ago, this video was made and then he was 18. So he's a part of this generation set. Um, and, and what he, you know, he's, he's already at that time pretty established producer and he's producing for artists like Kendrick Lamar. So he's already making pretty big hits. Um, and he could definitely, as you can see in this back end of this image, like he's in a pretty pricey studio and, and, and there's a lot of really nice tools there. But what he choice, what he chooses to do is, is that, you know, he works almost solely on his mobile phone. So he's tried several apps and kind of come, come down to uh, GarageBand as his uh, main hub at this point. And, and there he makes beats. He even uses the microphone, uh, sometimes with a pop filter to record. And, and he also has an iRig cable and, and, and plugs his guitar in. So, so he has a full production studio on a, on a mobile phone. And, and as I say, this is not a statement that this should work for everyone, but it's for me, it was personally very much of a proof of a concept of, of you know, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that this is not a professional producer. Um, and this is to not yet the professional producer, but that's my eight-year-old son uh, who, who, who has been, you know, in his upbringing, definitely a lot of, a lot of music tech around him. And what he has liked since he was very young is to make beats and and I've usually I I would set him up with either Ableton Live or a machine, and he would he would uh, either on a piano roll or a sequencer make some beats. But usually, like after a few minutes, I would have to help him help him with something, and he would pull me in. And 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 yeah, like it's a complex environment, and of course, you know, it's a five five six year old. But now with uh, Garrett's band and iPad, he can you know after a after a you know hour he actually could get pretty much all of his creative thoughts out there by himself and had several evenings afterwards in a, in a music making phase where, where it, was, it was pretty independent and was having a lot of fun. And so, so this was also a bit of like this, you know, kind of sparked the idea of what could we do uh, for kids and, and to onboard, to use these devices to onboard kids to them. Um, and that gets us uh, closer to what we're doing at Lottie. So our mission is to create a trusted and controlled digital world where kids can explore and play in a healthy environment. Um, we are a startup. We started about uh, a bit over a year ago. Uh, we have some, yeah, some decent seed funding and we have uh, also some angel investors, which include actually the founder of Zoom. So enabling us here today. Uh, and uh, one of the founders of SoundCloud and uh, some high level people from RTL, a, a television station here in, in Germany and, and, and some toy companies and more. So, so we've also gotten some people with us on this idea. And we've been uh, now with a team in Berlin prototyping uh, towards our first product. Uh, and I say like, this is, a, this is still in development and, and we, are, we are now currently testing and, and developing uh, yeah, together with, with several test, fam test families. Like I think we have about 25 test families who are in, we, we regularly interview and, and get feedback from and, and are, are um, iterating on our concept and adding, adding to our product. Um, but essentially what, what it is, it's, it is a dedicated device with the right content served in the right setting. And uh, I can explain a bit more. So maybe on the later one, the right setting, what we 
are doing is that we are, pro, you know, productizing proven psychological concepts and parental hacks around screen time. So we would like to help kids, you know, accept limits of, of you know, this is the beginning of a screen time and this is the end of a screen time and this is really, you know, fun while it lasts. But there's also we need to also learn the acceptance of when it's when it's over. And I know just personally from my household and from a lot of families and from a lot of families we interviewed that there's there tends to be some 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 difficult times with young children when they need to say good to to a tablet or, or to to the cartoons um so so that's that's one of the aims that we would like to do is to help create this um create this frame and and we are working with um with uh, pedagogues and media psychologists and and both academic, both academic and, and practicing and, and, and productizing these, these, what we usually do as parents with parental hacks. So for example, you know, now there are five minutes left and getting the kid to start preparing to, to prepare for the ending and so on. So there's a lot of these kind of routine expectation management type of concepts, which are used by parents a lot around other things and, and also in schools and, and kindergartens to kind of have people kids yeah knowing what comes next and 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 accepting a bit you know this is how we how we do things so so this is this is a part of the product and maybe more interestingly for for this round here is that yeah we we are also both licensing video content and also developing our own mini games or act, what we call activities and what we use as a basis for this is a development framework that um, that we also yeah, are working on with um, pedagogues and, and psychologists, which where we mapped out uh, five different areas of active development of children in this age group, and this includes, for example, so motor skills, memory, emotional and uh, social, emotional and social um, skills, and how to how to be in the world. And then there is uh, also, yeah, so like, and then there's some cogn cognitive ones, which is basically like the logic of, of, of math and, and language, but also like this kind of beginning of, you know, programming concepts and, and just generally this logic part. And then, yeah, even more importantly for this round, there's a creative one, which of course is very, very important. And, um, and even more importantly there in that area, there is the music part. Um, and I would say like we have you know, core, our core research uh, questions here on, on our music activities is, you know, can we teach basic concepts early on in a play-based setting? So, so children this age are really, you know, they're really absorbing a lot of knowledge. And, and we all know, for example, with, you know, if, 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 if a child learns a language at a really young age, you kind of it sticks even better than, than if you learn it at a later age. And um, so this is something that, that we want to try out and test with users and, and with, the, with the research and interfaces. Like, so can we start bringing these concepts earlier on and, and both spark an interest and, and for, for continued learning, make it more present in the kids, kids' life and, and also yeah, um, use use their their willingness and and you know to learn and of course always in a in a playful play based setting. Um, and the second one is also based on what before like can we use the platform to innovate on interfaces and processes and how you know and how do you introduce such concepts to to very young children and and so on. Um, should we? Switch over, Magnus. Do you want to maybe take over the screen and, and we'll talk more in more detail about yeah. the music activities? Yes. So I'll stop sharing then and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, so, I'm seeing a uh, five minute warning here. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wait. I'll be quick then. Uh, yeah, so what we really cared about uh, when we were building these music activities was that we would not end up with uh, 
childish toys, like the toys you see here. They are great for their purposes, but one problem is that they are often not very enjoyable for the parents. So the kids might sorry, enjoy sorry. them, but... Sorry, Magnus, I think you're, uh, you need to share the right screen. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Here we go. Are we on the right screen? Perfect. Yeah, that, that's more right. I'm very sorry. Yeah. The time warning got me stressed over here. Um, <laughs> so, so while these toys are great for all intents and purposes, uh, they, uh, we wanted to try something different, maybe inspire children. And yeah, like, like Stainer said, we can maybe get some ideas of how we can change the interfaces uh, for music creation. So we came up with a few concepts you can see over here. Uh, the bottom one, as you can see here, is just a basic piano, but the two ones on top are maybe a bit more interesting, uh, which I wanted to show you. Um, so when they first came to me uh, and asked me to build something for children, I uh, do the same thing as I usually do to tackle any problem. I use a synthesizer. So here's a synthesizer on the screen. And uh, what we want is that we want the su success ratio to be really quick. So you, you cannot do a wrong note. Um, so instead of a keyboard, we have this box. And when you press, get a small beat going on and if I start moving around the box to come to program the synthesizers but some internal testing with my two-year-old uh, gave me a hint that, that that might not work so we just reduced it totally to just a few very simple waves so that was our synthesizer and we've been run testing this a bit on kids and they seem to kind of enjoy it uh, we also came up with a different, a few other different activities. Um, one of them was coding. So uh, teaching coding is of course very important to young kids and understanding technology. Uh, and when we were building that, we figured out that one of the way of coding is, is sequencing. Uh, that's a, a, that's a principle that's a fundamental part of programming. So we thought, hey, let's just add some music to it as well. So we have these options over here and an elephant that tells you to, uh, to uh, select, select one of these options. So we can select them and this makes the elephant dance, but of course you can't, you, you can, but it's more fun to dance if you have music. So this gets a beat going on. To it. And this I find interesting because I think sequencing, at least for me, was a very good helped me understand programming way better. Multi-threading and multi-tracks and stuff like that made these concepts more simple. And then you can, of course, choose different loops. Um, another concept we had was so I really like Ableton. If you uh, the DAF and uh, what's nice about it is the view where everything is kind of synced. Uh, you can press a bunch of loops and they kind of sync and that makes a lot of fun. Uh, I tried showing it to my two-year-old and he didn't get that so we figured we might have to simplify it a bit. So what we did is we removed the grid and just added like a few colorful icons and if I press it they start playing a beat and no matter when I press it, everything will stay in sync, basically. And uh, you can also trigger some one shots like magic, because everyone loves magic. And uh, <clears throat> since we already had a synthesizer, why not just add the synthesizer in there for fun? In a shape of. Here we have this small tool, which is a very basic uh, loop station with some samples. Uh, and then we asked parents what their kids like musically. And of course, uh, like we expected, they said Steve Reich, because that's young kids really enjoy Steve Reich. So we made one which was really inspired by 
by, by his work, where we then thought, hey, they, they, what if we make the music in such a way that it doesn't have to stay in sync to sound nice? So here we have a bunch of small loops that don't have to be in sync to sound nice. And the difference when you trigger them changes the melody. And uh, of course, you could add a beat to that and trigger your accept notes. And we put in a synthesizer as well. And uh, these are like just very early uh, excursions into into developing musical things for kids, um, and uh, <clears throat> and we are very excited to kind of dig a little deeper and try to figure out even more interesting concepts. And uh, we are very very interested in collaborations. If somebody has a great idea, or if you have kids that you want to teach, we are very interested to. Uh, have a discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Steinan and Magnus. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so we again, we've got a, a space for specific questions um, relating to, to that talk. Um, um, so if there's anyone who has questions, please either put up your hand, or you can post in the chat if you prefer and I can I can ask the question up to you. So, Carola. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to the Lottie team, um, because something that has been on my mind, which of course is on the mind of our Chime network, is how do we uh, get the innovation which we quite often have lying on the shelves of our uh, universities through PhD projects, how do we get that out in into the world? You know, this, this notion and specifically, I think it's probably fair to say that the UK is quite bad with that because the incentive models within higher education rather suggest that the brownie points means that you stay in academia rather than go out and form a company. So, you know, we, we, we got to do a bit better. But of course, that's what the China network is. So from your experience, um, you know, do you work with universities? What has worked? Um, are there th lessons to be learned of, of um, being better in, in taking that innovation out from the universities and into, um, you know, into the world in order for us all to benefit from a much more diverse amount of stuff, uh, creative stuff that, that we can engage in? Um, yes, yes, I, I mean, fully there with you and i think that that's you know i think there's a lot of missed opportunities when when we are as, as tom said also at the different sides of the tracks and and that's not how it should be and um, this is actually something that i was took very much a passion for at native as well like when you know both when i was doing bsp research um and well as well on the broader scale as as head of research collaborations um and if there's a perfect way like we, we did a couple of joint kind of EU funded projects which I thought were really inspiring and that really kind of brought several researchers closer together. I mean these are sometimes a bit difficult for industry because our you know it changes like our requirements change pretty fast and if we're applying for a three-year project it will be approved next year like and, and what we will be doing in four years we don't have a clue. So it's always like this uh, magic of of trying to you know write it broad enough so that you can pivot within there, but it's um, mm. but that it's still meaningful. Um, no, I think yeah, I mean and this in my experience was a good platform. Also having maybe you know PhD students coming over and 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 working together or or, or postdocs. Um, and and yeah, and then also you know networks like this. That's also great yeah. that that we start a dialogue because I think that that was also my feeling at at um, yeah when as soon as you start this dialogue, everyone everyone wants it to happen, but it's not happening enough. That that researchers yes. want to also be and they want to be working on something that users want and and that we are 
uh, that that there is you know that there is whether market or at least users for and that's something that industry companies tend to know quite a lot from from how how we do user testing and in touch with them and and at the same time I think you know we can we can definitely you know lift ourselves to like do more quality work and push more boundaries in industry if we you know there's so much of great work and and really it's kind of like this pushing the line that's happening in, in academia so I think that's yeah it's definitely like creating these platforms and projects where we can work closer together um at, yeah say so a lot of, like we we uh, yeah native we, we worked quite a lot with with music tech researchers um, at lotti so far it's as uh, we're pretty early that we 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 work with as uh, we have a great advisor that's a, a media psychology um, professor at the university of Würzburg here in, in in germany and and we have sessions with her regularly uh, we also have some practitioners and and kind of pedagogical you know values that we check in with regularly and and develop these uh, activities together but this is also as Martin said like we would be very interested in having more you know conversations mm -hmm. and and i think that's as you say like there's so many innovative ideas out there and and there was actually just uh, visiting also Tor, uh, Tor Adler and, and, and uh, the University of Iceland last week and, and the new uh, lab there like and, and that you know there are so many interesting ideas that that you know that that's part just from a single conversation so it, we would really yeah like and, and there are so many also interesting ideas that that you know we, we tend to be a bit you know always looking a bit into the past for for inspiration and 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 but I you know for example some of the research they were doing there was really like really like a lot of like yeah of course yes why wouldn't you uh, so so yeah no but, but that's I say like we would we would very much love to get in touch with um, and and somehow figure out a way to Thank collaborate. Yeah. Alan, I think your hand was up next. It is. Uh, this is. It's. A, it's a lovely product. I. I. I your. Your demo sounded and looked beautiful. Uh, and I, I. I particularly appreciate it when. Uh, when the sound quality is. Uh, uh, at a professional standard, and definitely in my own work with children, I've always felt that you know if you're giving them a violin or a piano, you would give them the best that you could afford because cheap instruments make horrible noises. So, so that's that's really really nice that you're doing that. Um, Thank you. I, I I do have a question though, just about the broader ambitions of this project. And here I'm really thinking of the work that has been done uh, at the MIT Media Lab over many years, where of course they 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 have a very strong focus uh, uh, in the legacy of Seymour Papert and various successes, um, and in particular the the contributions around the one lap laptop per child project which which created this kind of specially packaged device that was optimized not for the same age group and the situation of children you're working with but i think with some of the same ambitions um, and eric rosenbaum who was in that in that lab um, spent years making touch driven applications uh, for music specifically for sound control and music and i think uh, some similarities some visual similarities to what you're making so I guess, firstly, I, I was just wondering whether you've been informed by Eric's work and whether you know of the various uh, sort of iPad products and so on that came out of the, the group. Um, and then secondly, this more ambitious question of that, that system um, was definitely tr pursuing the kind of Alan Kay vision of a cross media uh, that, that being creative in one medium allows you to be creative in all and that such a system should also be an encyclopedia and a programming language and, and a publishing platform and a video. Uh, so, you know, obviously you, you need to start from one position, but I, I, I'm wondering whether you also have a sort of similar vision that in the longer term, your, your product becomes a kind of, you know, children's educational portal of some kind. Yes, yes, a lot of good comments and, and good questions. I mean, maybe to the first one, yes, I mean, I very much, uh, or we very much agree with you that you know it doesn't need to be childish to 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 have be attractive to kids. So that's also why we are actually working with uh, one of you know sound designers from Native Instruments from my past 
artwork and, and we want to, you know, it should, it can be playful and, and maybe dorky, but it, you know, it doesn't need to be childish. So it needs to be, you know, it should be um, satisfying both for, for guardians and, and children to both listen to a for extended amount of time and, and, and play with. And also, I mean, these devices, as you said, like are in, are in our homes and we're going to hear them a lot. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's why we want to make it sound sound professional and nice um, um in terms of the yeah one one laptop per child yeah i was i'm very much a fan of that project and i followed that the other one actually i would love to yeah I, i'm gonna follow up on that i did participate in some hack days at the mit media lab did some years ago with lego that was also really interesting and also focusing on music production um yeah but that's actually a good point Pointer. I'm. I'm gonna. We're gonna check that out uh, in more detail. Uh, sounds very interesting. Um, and and maybe on the broader question, uh, you know, the broader activity. So we we actually do have uh, a lot of. I say like this is only a small subset of the activities that we're developing. Um, I think maybe you know an out of proportion passion of ours maybe a bit, but 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 we are also developing a lot of uh, both kind of these educational activities uh, as well as yeah the yeah in 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 these diverse areas that I mentioned like so basically also adhering to motor skills to memory and 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 these kind of social emotional um, and and including some kind of programming logic logic work. Um, and so what is also what we think is also like in kind of an educational product yes i think there's definitely a lot more potential for for tablets to be um educational products in terms of you know we you know we also given you know we have, it's two to seven year olds and and it needs to be also fun for them to engage and wanting to come back. We don't want it to be something that kids are forced to. And that's also what is very much our guidance in, in our activity development is that it needs to be, you know, play-based. And, and we also think learning is much more than only learning to read and, and do math. It's it's actually like all of these diverse skills that you need to be an individual in the world. So that's also we want to develop. I don't know if I'm, you know, just kind of going in circles or answering your question there, but yeah, but like generally, like on the activities, like they are on a broader scale, and and also one of the drive there is that, you know, there's a part of a screen time version, and also, would we as parents thought, you know, there's a lot you can learn from from cartoons and and, and videos, and and a lot of it is really high good production. Uh, but we also, you know, just from me as a, an engineer and, and a music person, I, I learn more by hands-on doing than to only watching a video tutorial. And that's also a bit like what is driving us. Like, can we make activities that are so attractive to kids that they even, you know, prefer that over watching a cartoon and, and or, or, or creating this balanced experience such that it's not only the, the kids' screen time is not this. Um, let's say like one hour of, of just you know passive consumption but also this mix of passive and active learning um, maybe magnus i'm i'm completely uh, jumping on everything here is there something you would like to add to this no i think you kind of covered it i think like our main goal is to build like healthy habits with the machine and uh, the reason what like the activities and what we keep in mind there in the back when we're developing these activities is that these should not be addictive in any way like they should not make you want to do more there shouldn't be any meta gaming or anything involved as 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 figuring out how we can make stuff for children so you can make a melody and save it that we need to think a bit through because give a digital camera to a child and there will be a lot of pictures in there because there's so there's a lot of thought you need to put in it when you allow allow people to go full on creative how can we make give the freedom but still kind of maintain some structure and value to what you create just to say that healthy non-addictive is a wonderful idea um wordle for music i think we may need possibly yes um but Probably running towards the general discussion now, I guess, but Lamberto, your hand's also up. 
I'll be quick, I'll be quick. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I have a question for Magnus really, I think uh, regarding uh, the, the musical interactions that you showed us in, in, the, in your product. And I was wondering, you seem to make a lot of assumptions of what uh, children may or may not like in terms of music. And I was wondering, how did you uh, reach those decisions? Uh, you know, I know that it's difficult to do the participatory design with the particular, you know, demographics that you are working with, but uh, I'm wondering what kind of approach have you taken in order to decide what kind of music children should be working with or playing with, rather? Yeah. Of course, my, my, my assumption, my statement about children liking Steve Reich was mainly meant as a joke, other than, than I really like it. Uh, <laughs> But I think it, it, uh, uh, from there, I mean, we, 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 we have test users that we are testing with children and uh, being a parent myself and having and other employees being parents, uh, we kind of try, we've tried a bit out selecting different loops and stuff like that. But with concerning the maturity of the sounds and the devices, I just go by the notion that your child doesn't want to play with the, the plastic play phone you gave to him that makes funny noises. The child wants to play with your phone. Uh, that's, so I, I think that's also sometimes a, a, a pretty good thing to have in the back of your mind. But uh, we are very like user and test driven. So we test our things with children uh, and, uh, but we aren't that far in the process to be really trying out many different sounds. But uh, my notion towards the Steve Reich was, I find it just so interesting that uh, I, I was way too old when I discovered that we could kind of make music in such a way. And I wish I'd been way younger. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, just to check Carol, is that a legacy hand or is that a newly up hand? I think perhaps that's a legacy hand. <laughs> um, Okay, so the plan is to kind of um, transition slightly into a more general discussion. You know, we have quite a, um, just looking at the names on the participant list, this is a really interesting group here um, assembled. And I suspect that if we start to talk more generally about um, wider questions around music and HCI, we, we have many people on the floor who could offer interesting perspectives as well. So. That's why I was hoping to, to broad thing, broaden things at this point. We're also interested in broadening things, partly because we want to understand how best our network might facilitate things, which we've already touched on a bit. But, you know, we're, we're here to try and support um, activity in this area how best we can. So we'd be really interested in hearing from um, anyone here who, who has particular visions for what might be the important work to do, you know, what's been missing what might be valuable to, to look at and how might this network kind of build into that. Um, so that would be my opening pitch. Does anyone have any kind of um, particularly strong thoughts about how things are starting to evolve in this discipline, um, if, if, if you can call it a kind of discipline, um, and, and what are the upcoming challenges? Or is that way too broad to try and kick off things? <laughs> I, I do have one question, but if anyone else has a question, then they'll take priority. I, I'll just take the uh, little starting point, if I may, from one uh, um, of the sh slides that uh, that uh, I, I think uh, Stein was was showing us, and this idea that 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 uh, we should probably think about standards and. Uh, this tension between standards stifling innovation, but also standards allowing uh, the, the sharing of a common language and the sharing of common experiences. So uh, how important it is for this community to look at uh, making, uh, strengthening the ability to work with existing tools and making those tools more sustainable or always trying to invent new tools. And I think that's always a, an interesting tension and, and I wonder what, what are the thoughts around the table um, here? Um, if really in, in the context, in the wider context of what is sustainability for, for all of us in all sorts of different uh, uh, areas of our work and life, uh, if uh, our relationship with technology should be 
more in terms of uh, trying to strengthen and reinforce the things that we know how to do and already exist rather than inventing all the time new ones, especially in a, in a creative context. And I'm also referring to you know, how AI and music creativity really also are on a collision course, which uh, um, might, might be, again, another interesting area of discussion for, for this uh, group. Sorry, I threw in a lot of stuff. For the... <laughs> well, let, maybe, let me maybe throw one in which somewhat relates to that. Um, so this came from um, Wendy's um, talk. So um, in the work Wendy showed us at the end of her talk, um, so this tool had been made that allowed this serious um, composer and scholar to work with his preferred medium, you know, which was, um, uh, you know, pen and paper, essentially. Um, but one of the things that interested me is if the PhD student concern had been in as many of us are, you know, scattered in a computer science department here or whatever it might be, a music technology department here. Um, a PhD student coming up to probation um, and being um, interrogated by people who have nothing to do with music and human computer interaction to see if they got a viable PhD idea, um, they might have said, oh, great, you've done this very interesting tool with musical applications and um, how are you going to evaluate it you know we want some numbers or we want to know exactly what kind of ethnographic method you're going to apply and for me the joy of what actually happened in the in the research that wendy described was that um, this was an in-depth piece of work with this individual composer and rigorous um, conclusions were able to come out of this. But um, my approximate question is um, sort of how can we give um, PhD students scattered in different departments with skeptical um, assessors, um, you know, at the stage where people are uh, 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 sort of um, upgrading their PhD in, in, in the first year, how can we um, how can we give people methodological protection? I suppose that would be my. <laughs> Um, so dying to to jump in on that. It's such an interesting question, Simon, because it, of course it's not just in the music tech area. It's a, it's a general challenge in 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 higher education for all interdisciplinary subjects. And actually, I found myself even today um, discussing this with actually uh, a member of this school. But actually, in terms of how we in the UK do the viva of a PhD differently than on the continent. So we, of course, in the UK have a viva, uh, which is private to the examiners uh, in, in a private setting, whereas many countries on the continent have a public viva. And the nature of the scrutiny differs there. So on the one hand, one could argue that in Britain it tends to be, uh, um, you know, more rigorous because the questions are more uh, deep uh, and you have the time to have more deep questions. But also it's limited. The narrowness is there as well. Whereas on, on, on the, you know, in some of the other countries where you have a public viva, the diversity of um, inquiries comes to bear on the scrutiny of a viable you know, piece of new knowledge. And I think that brings me also back to Wendy's because what I found so um, fabulous of, of Wendy's talk is this focus on that in, in all processes, in the design process, but also in the evaluation process, participatory processes are really uh, have put, have the potential to to allow us to be much more diverse in our solution finding processes than when we had a much more linear process. So to to consider much less linear processes, and of course it goes into open innovation kind of systems. It, it goes into what I call culture three point zero or open innovation two point zero kind of processes. Uh, but non linear processes help us to allow the diversity of needs and requirements, but also solutions to, to possibly emerge much more than than closing it down. But you know what that means for chime, I don't know, because it's such a big question. 
Wendy, your hands up. Yes, um, thank you. I mean, it's an interesting problem. And um, I, of course, am in a computer science department and it's a French computer science department. So the model of the world is everything is a mathematical question that can be solved with a better algorithm. And we're, of course, not saying that. I mean, great algorithms are great, wonderful, thank you, but it's not the only thing. Um, so what I do, and I didn't do in this talk, I thought about it, but 20 minutes is short, so I didn't. Um, but I talk, I go back to, fundamentals and I talk about the difference between natural sciences and the sciences of the artificial. And in all natural sciences, you have a back and forth between theoretical work and empirical work. You can start with a theory and test it, which is the kind of classic stereotypical way of thinking about a scientist with a white coat doing an experiment and doing that. But you can also go in the other direction, which is to start with empirical findings and develop theory, which is what anthropologists do, but also astrophysicists and geologists and, and um, you know, archeologists and so on. So they're both very legitimate forms of scientific inquiry and highly rigorous in their own ways. The ways they make theory are somewhat different. The kinds of theories that they have, the shape of the theories, the goals of the theories may differ from descriptive to predictive to controlling things to generative, um, but it's that back and forth. And then when you run into what Herb Simon calls the sciences of the artificial, which is where we are, um, you have all of the demands of theoretical work and um, empirical work, which you get with working with human beings. And on top of that, you get the fact that we actually build artifacts, we build new technology, and we study what we built. So we're not unbiased observers who sit back and say, you know, that's a DNA molecule. Um, we're actively involved in the creation process. So we can be rigorous in that. And there's a lot of uh, descriptions of how you can be rigorous in different ways. But what I find is that when I talk to my colleagues um, who are coming in with some, frankly, limited stereotypes about how things should be, if you back up a bit and you say, well, look, you know, are we less scientific than an astrophysicist, really? Um, you know, are we less scientific than whatever? So no, we're not. Um, you have to be very rigorous about the, the things that you choose to be rigorous on. Uh, one of the things that's always funny in terms of this is that when people think about creativity, if they haven't studied it or thought about it, they kind of think, well, it's kind of fuzzy and random, which of course is not. Um, and so you can be rigorous about creative processes, but it's not the same kind of activities that you do if you're trying to build a new algorithm. So anyway, that's kind of um, getting at part of your question, Simon, about sort of how do you manage that? Um, and I guess, I guess the thing that I find is that we teach our students these methods and then they go into industry in their internships and their master's theses and go on. And, and, and a few of them start companies as well, but a lot of them just go into industry and they find themselves teaching people in industry how to do this because it's way more effective. It's less expensive. You get better stuff and people like the results better. So why not do it? Um, it's just not the traditional way that a lot of these things are taught. So we can get there. <laughs>